Welcome to This Academic Life, Episode 2. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm a professor of physics and associate dean of research. Hi, I'm Pania Newell. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering. In each show, we share stories and look into the incredible journey that impacts STEM education and research. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering. Kim, Pania, and I are the hosts for this show. Our goal is to encourage, inspire, and support each other as we all explore and thrive in this academic life. In this episode, we'll be talking about pandemic impact on research productivity. COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us in so many different ways. It affected the way we live, affected the way we communicate with our friends, family, colleagues, and it obviously impacted the way we work. And in the world of academia, um, it has impacted the way we teach, the way we do research. And we all know that research is a huge part of our academic enterprise. So today we'll be focusing on how this pandemic has affected the way we do research. So we're so happy to have Professor Harold Park from Boston University. Harold is an old friend of mine from graduate school. He is currently a professor in mechanical engineering. He joined Boston University in 2010. And before that, he was at Vanderbilt and Colorado Boulder. His research is on computational methodologies to address mechanics uh, type of problems at various length and time scales. One reason that we're inviting him is because he was the associate dean for research and technology development during pandemic for College of Engineering from 2019 to 2020. Thanks for having me on. Welcome, Harold, uh, to this Academic Life podcast. Today, we will discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of the impact of the pandemic on research productivity. So we're going to start off with light questions, right? You know, the pandemic has affected all of us in many different ways. Our first question is, what good has come out of the pandemic? I mean, most of the good has been personal. We've spent obviously a lot more time with family and kids. I think our kids know us better than before. We know them better than before. All of this is for better or worse, I don't know. Um, You know, we've developed new hobbies. We've done some biking, reading, you know, TV, um, new family activities. My wife and I can eat lunch together every day, <laughs> which may or may not be good, but it's happening. It's great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I think we're just much closer as a family. So I think that's probably been the biggest plus of the pandemic. Are there any issues? You mentioned that, you know, you spend more time with your kids. Are there other issues that have come up in terms of just childcare or having the children around all the time? Absolutely. I mean, as I think all of us have experienced when your kids come screaming into your Zoom call, when you're talking to your department chair or whatever is going on, um, that's definitely happened. You know, we have a small house. So, you know, even when they're, we have a babysitter who's taking care of them, like, but they're running around and screaming, you know, it makes it really hard to like focus and do like deep thinking activities. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been hard. Definitely. Yeah, I think overall there is a yeah, sort of a reallocation of time uh, for all of us. Our priorities have changed. And I think that the good thing is, uh, at least I know we, we both have a similar age of kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one thing I realize is that we've been overworking. <laughs> <laughs> we do need to spend more time with kids. One study I found, it was published uh, in Nature back in July, 2020. And it was actually from a group of researchers at Northwestern, uh, our uh, alma mater. And um, so they found that the overall productivity, like working in terms of just general working, during the pandemic, it went down from 60 some hours to 50 some hours a week. So, So it was reduced 11 hours on average for research across STEM fields, okay. right? So that's one thing that research had found. That was a survey of over 4,500 faculty from across the uh, entire U.S. and Europe. Mm-hmm. In terms of the tasks 
right? So we have research, we have teaching, and then we have grant writing, right? So fund seeking, and also administrative tasks. Among the four, research is the only one that went down. And this is by tracing, you know, obviously um, many researchers across many different disciplines inside STEM fields, mm -hmm. right? So I think we all observe that, right? Definitely. I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense. You can't, you know, your teaching is a constant that has to stay fixed. Your service and meetings are fixed things that don't decrease. So what gets sacrificed? It's got to be research. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one way we can look at this is that there was a shift from research to this online situation, online classes. So um, as the associate dean, you handled the transition from this in-person to online classes at the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. What was the immediate response that allowed your school to continue with research activities? So actually, when we were when I was the associate dean and the pandemic started, we would normally have you know weekly meetings with the college executive committee. We would discuss research, teaching, all the departmental stuff. But then when COVID started, research basically fell off the table. Like it, it was not really considered. You know, that's because obviously we had to get um, how do you standardize the 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 online teaching. How do you get faculty to learn how to use their iPads and Zoom at the same time? You know, how do you how do you get like lab equipment and do virtual labs? How do you test grade? You know, all these things. You know, Zoom was a mystery to a lot of our faculty at you know back in March. So I think that's actually where most of the time was spent from the administrative point of view. And only later on, when the cases started coming down on the East Coast in like May or June, was the the research part of it like more, um, you know, become more equal in terms of the discussion. Research part of it like more, um, you know, become more equal in terms of the discussion. Another data coming out of this paper I was talking about was it also varies across disciplines. Like traditionally, say like chemistry or. Um, you know, chemical engineering, where a lot of the research has to be uh, in the lab, hands-on type of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, those uh, researchers, they reported about 30 to 40 percent reduction in research hours compared to pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. But and then for people who do sort of what we do, computational type of work, math, statistics, um, we are impacted too, but that's about nine, ten percent. So in you know in that relation, we can just see how um, that kind of also unevenly distributed, even within the STEM fields itself. That's right. Yeah, I think I think people obviously have observed this. Like, you know, we can just take our computers and go home. You know, and obviously most of us had colleagues with labs that got shut down for you know what four, five, six months, and and yeah, so. Yeah, we were definitely better off in one way. Right. So I'm um, thinking about all of this um, reduction in productivity. Um, we're going to move into the bad, right, mm -hmm. of this whole pandemic. What were your major challenges in maintaining your research productivity during the pandemic? So personally, how has it affected your research productivity? Um, it's been bad. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of someone who writes like 30 papers a year. <laughs> I just I just filled out my faculty annual report and it was not so good. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge I think everybody had is there was just a lot more time, lost less time for everything. You know, in the spring, most of my mornings were taken up by meetings related to being associate dean. But then um, I would take over taking care of my kids after lunch because my wife handled the morning. And so, you know, it's, it's like a 20 hour work week. And then by nighttime, you're exhausted because you spent all day with your kids indoors. <laughs> and all you want to do is, you know, watch a movie and go to bed. So, yeah, it's been hard. I mean, I think the other thing that's been really hard is that a lot of the things you sort of take for granted in terms of like schools doing for you, for your kids, right? Like you don't have to worry about what they're learning or what their curriculum is or whether they're, you know, doing great appropriate um, activities or, or skills. You know, those are things in the spring we had to talk about every night because, you know, they were getting so little on, um, online or in-person experience for, for schools. 
So all these things, you know, we, as you're basically being a second teacher to your kids, it really, you know, took up a lot of time and, you know, it's inevitable that research suffers at that point. Um, I think a few other things I would talk about is, you know, it's been almost a year now and, you know, working and sleeping in the same room is not really good for your research productivity. <laughs> Agree. You know? I think, I think it's that's not good feng shui. <laughs> no, there's, there's just something wrong with that. That's, that's not so good. And then just more individually related to me, I think my plan was to, before the pandemic was to be associate dean for a year. And then, you know, knowing that that would take up a lot of time, come back this year and, you know, get my research going. <laughs> and that really didn't happen either. So. <laughs> Taking a pause. I think that's okay. So, <laughs> so yeah. But Harold, there might be people who are listening that said, think about all of those proposals that, you know, are related to COVID-19 studies. Couldn't you and Lucy come together and come up with some computational mechanics to solve this problem, to get this vaccine moving along quicker? Couldn't you use some machine learning and that would increase your research productivity? What do you say to those people? I would say, and this is not being facetious, that, you know, those people were more creative than I was. But yeah, I did see some people in our community doing machine learning to track like COVID spread and things like that. And yeah, you know, I think some people were definitely, let's say, better at being flexible in terms of adapting their research to the opportunities that arose. Um, yeah, I, I was not so good at that, but that's my own personal <laughs> challenge more than anything else. No, I'm just giving you a hard time because I'm a physicist. And so I should, I could say the same thing about myself. Can't I move some electrons around and, you know, <laughs> there's a scaling some quantum somewhere. Mechanic, yeah, get some quantum <laughs> mechanic tunnel, you know, tunneling going on, uh, use the uncertainty principle. So I totally understand that some of the, the calls and solicitations that came out for me, I would really have to tweak my work a lot to get it to fit. And then when you do that, you could end up doing a disservice to what the call was for. So, you know, it's better to leave that for me, I think, to the expert. I was just giving you a hard time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you related to that. Do you think that um, the way each institution is setting their research priorities would change as a result of this? My question is to say, well, are they going to design another priority that was, say, you know, more focused on computational, for example, because mm -hmm. they're not equipment heavy? You think there will be a sort of a change in that transition towards something that's more resilient to uncertainties? Well, I think it might accelerate some trends that were starting before the pandemic. So for example, I think not just at BU, but I think nationally, there's been a trend sort of away from the humanities and more towards STEM for a variety of reasons, you know, due to student enrollment, due to being more funding in STEM and things like that. I think that's likely to accelerate because we just, you know, basically went through a long period of time where tuition dollars were hard to come by. And you know, research dollars are still there to like pop up some of the some of the university finances. So yeah, I think I think computation, I think, you know, obviously machine learning, big data, all of that has become even more prevalent. And this is probably just gonna accelerate those trends a lot. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will also accelerate trends in sort of convergence or interact intersections between medicine and engineering and some of the other, you know, sciences as you know, the, the problems from COVID have shown there's some benefit to that. So maybe there'll be some additional collaboration that emerges in the future as well. That's true. Yeah, I definitely agree. Thinking about major challenges, what have been some of the major challenges you've seen that have impacted either students or faculty or both due to the limited in-person interactions? Um, I would say a lot. I mean, this covers some of the, I think the, the things you want to discuss, but I would say like just for myself, a lot of, and actually this is one of the things I had underrated as an impact until recently is, you know, now if we want to talk to our colleagues, you have to put a Zoom meeting on the calendar, right? Like normally I would just walk one door down, two doors down, three doors down. We would talk in the hallway, you know, we'd say, this is our proposal issue we're having. Let's bang it out in 30 minutes and then get back to work. Now we have to schedule a Zoom call. You know, it may or may not happen for weeks, like, because everyone's busy. 
right. and yeah, it just slows that whole, you know, creative process down a lot. And I think students, I think, are having the same issue. Like, you know, if you teach for virtual office hours or if you work with your PhD students, my PhD student and I had a meeting last week where after an hour, I realized, like, if you just show me your screen and, like, show me the equations you're solving, show me the model you're using so I can understand what you're doing, this might help a lot. But if we were just sitting together from the from five minutes in, you know, we could have written on a sheet of paper right in front of us, worked it out, and been done with it. So, you know, it's just highly inefficient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think overall, I think, um, you know, the, the, the mentoring, you know, the relationship between students and, and advisor or faculty, and then the personal sort of uh, relationship building process from just the casual conversations, it's now has to be all scheduled. It's no longer natural. So it really limited us in many ways, how we communicate and how we build a relationship. I agree. Um, so now to the really ugly. So we progressively went from good, <laughs> bad, and now we're at the ugly. So let's talk a little bit about um, tenure track faculty, um, which I feel have would probably see the most stress from this pandemic. How much do you think uh, the pandemic has impacted their research progress toward their tenure goals? For example, have you heard any chatter in the virtual hallways about any of their concerns? Well, first of all, you know, I think universities are responding by, well, I don't know if, if everyone's doing that, but at least at BU, like everyone got a one year automatic extension. So I think that's one thing that can help relieve the stress of, you know, what's going on. I'll talk about tenure track, but I think there has been impacts in different ways, depending on your age, but let's start with tenure track. So for that age, people are probably most concerned about like, okay, you know, you need a certain number of beans to count when you apply for tenure, right? You need journal papers, you need funding, you need talks and all this stuff, that kind of stuff people recognize. But I think the thing that is going to be hardest to replicate is the networking that has to happen in order to get these things. So like, for example, how are you going to meet the leaders in your field who are probably going to be writing you tenure letters? You know, how do you visit schools, meet faculty, you know, who are also going to write you letters and or start research collaborations. You know, when you go to conferences, you can't or, you know, you can't talk to people after your talk that well to like talk, go to lunch, you know, meet, make a collaboration, make it, you know, make a network. Um, I think that's the thing that's going to be hardest to replicate. I suspect that like, you know, people are still going to write proposals. People are still going to write papers, but this sort of like multiplying effect that you get from knowing people, I think is going to be the hardest thing to replicate. I so agree that networking, and I think it's a huge part of building up your research and that's missing and it, or at least it's difficult to, yeah, to replicate. So, yeah, yeah right. like Lucia started this, uh, the women's chapter of the USACM, you know, that's a great networking opportunity. That's probably really hard to, to replicate now in the virtual world. Right. Oh, Panya is doing a lot of work for that, <laughs> <laughs> that chapter, a lot of work. And it's amazing. Um, we're, we're doing the best we can for that chapter. It's yeah. And yeah, so I mean, actually, as a junior faculty, uh, I, I've been reading a lot about the, the impact of the pandemic, particularly on junior faculty. And I uh, came across this report by Johns Hopkins that they mentioned that it was published in July 2020. And they indicated that the pandemic actually had a disproportionate impact on junior faculty. And they highlighted that there are various reasons for that because uh, comparing to the senior faculty, junior faculty, they are still uh, building their research infrastructure and establishing scholarly agendas and securing grants. And, uh, and they have long-term plan for uh, achieving promotion and tenure and their goals are well aligned in that direction. But uh, this pandemic has disrupted this process. So um, I was wondering, what do you think that the long-term impact of the pandemic would be on junior faculty's career? Um, I think it's hard to say. I mean, I'm sure it's a net negative overall if you average overall faculty. I think it also sort of depends on how the junior faculty were doing before the pandemic. Because I think, you know, I was talking to my wife and I was telling her about my own challenges. And 
I was telling her the thing that's hard to realize when you're outside of academia is how much of a momentum driven process this job is when you're doing well and you have lots of collaborations and grants, like things just happen because you have so many balls in the air. And I think that's probably the hardest thing as a junior faculty is you haven't quite established that network yet. And so the momentum is, is hard to continue and you're kind of working by yourself. So I also want to talk about senior faculty. I think the other demographic that's getting hit really hard are basically very successful mid-career faculty who are also now being tasked with a lot of administrative responsibilities because they've gotten tenure and they've been successful. And now, and they're also at the age where they have young kids who are like, you know, let's say fourth grade and under. So I know a lot of folks in that demographic, myself included. And I, I think like that's another one where like your momentum is getting killed during this pandemic for better or worse. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Talking about momentum, I so agree. I mean, just even before COVID, just having kids, I completely lost momentum and it took double the amount of time to get it back. And I experienced it and it's, it's detrimental. It can be detrimental if you don't take care of it uh, in a timely manner. Yeah, so right. any, any shock to the system, I guess it just, you know, it pushes us far from equilibrium and it's it's hard to come back, I guess, to the equilibrium position. This and one study I found, um, the same one that I referred to earlier, it says that scientists uh, who have kids five years or younger, they have the most dramatic decrease or decline in research time. So we're talking about 17% more comparing to all the other groups of people. So, I mean, obviously having kids or younger kids belongs to that group that's the most uh, hit. And then the women who have the natural instinct of being the primary caregiver, that's a double hit for them. So there, the study had actually evaluated this uh, set of data and it can raise an alarm um, for a lot of institutions. I think these are the group of people that we need to keep track because these long-term effect is not something that we can see at current time or instantaneously because it would propagate, it would affect the long-term of their long-term career. That's definitely true. Also, Harold, you mentioned that at Boston University, they automatically gave an extension, one-year extension to all junior faculty. I wish that we had a standard that was implemented throughout the whole nation. And if it was supposed to be given automatically, or it was supposed to be, you know, through the uh, systematic uh, approval process, I wish that it was uniform. But uh at least I'm, I'm glad to hear that at uh, University of Boston, it was given to all junior faculty. Yeah, again, I don't know how prevalent this philosophy was nationwide, but yeah, definitely, at least here, like people were immediately cognizant that, you know, everyone was going to take a hit tenure track. So knowing that things got wiped out, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to, to force people, you know, it, like, it also reflects poorly on the college, right? Because if the college is sending out for letters and they all of a sudden have a bunch of candidates who did nothing for two years or, you know, whatever it is, one to two years, not necessarily through fault of their own, it doesn't reflect well on us either. And I think uh, from what I know, it's um, for this survey that I've been talking about at the time, this is back in, the survey was done back in April of 2020, one month into the shutdown mm -hmm. or the shutdown of campuses and everything. At that time, 30 out of 34 institutions had already. So I think even back then, people had realized how important it is to give that kind of um, support or protection uh, that uh, these junior faculty or, you know, uh, typically considered as a disadvantaged group of people should have. Can you imagine starting as a junior faculty and the pandemic hit? I mean, so you're already, you know, you're isolated from everything. You barely, you just started going to your first faculty meeting. And so I think it's, it's pretty difficult. And I think we should do our best to try to, since we're all senior, I think we should, and I should do air quotes around senior, <laughs> but I think you bring up some really good points. And I feel like we should be a little bit more accountable 
since we are aware of this, maybe we should reach out to the junior faculty in our department and say, hey, how is it going? And and talk to them, right? And see if there's anything we can do to help. I know I've been doing a little bit of self-promotion for my junior faculty, you know, nominating them for awards that I wouldn't necessarily do because I'm so busy doing other things, talking to them, introducing them to my collaborators. So maybe we can shift the gears a little bit and try to help them out because the universities do invest a lot of funds, startup funds, startup packages into the junior faculty. And, you know, we selected them because we wanted them to succeed, right? Not to weed them out. So I think we shouldn't let the pandemic weed them out. And since we know about these issues, just try to motivate them along as best we can. So Harold, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I think you gave us a lot of things to think about, and we hope that we can have you back again to talk about some other aspects and pick your brain about, you know, being a associate dean. Maybe you want to be university president one day. So thank you so much, Harold. Uh, thank Harold, you, Kim. Thank wonderful. you, Lucy. Thank so you, Pania. Much. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really enjoy talking with you. That was a great conversation with Harold Park, a professor of mechanical engineering from Boston University. Find us at thisacademiclife.org or follow us on Facebook. You can listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts. Please rate us. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of This Academic Life.